All right, we're in downtown Calgary. We're gonna head over the Peace Bridge and we are not gonna do a walk and talk through this thing again. Welcome back, Deep Review TV viewers. It's Chris Nichols here from Deep Review TV. Uh, as you can see, we're doing a walk and talk through the Peace Bridge, so I lost that argument. That's Jordan's fault. But uh, first thing I wanna get out of the way, I apologize for my voice. I'm just getting over a bad cold. So you're gonna get this smoky, sexy Chris Nichols voice today. It's gonna be super sexy. That is until I start hacking and coughing. But that's okay, because I wanted to get here and shoot for you guys, because we've got the Panasonic LX100 Mark II. This brand new iteration of a very popular pocket size camera. I'm gonna take it around town today, see how it does. Now we have to keep in mind, it's been four years since the LX100 came out on the market. And you know, looking at these two cameras, I got an original one right here. The chassis are basically identical. I mean, button placement is all identical. They've just renamed some of the functions. You know, function two is now function four, stuff like that. Normally I complain about that. I'd say we've had four years, why not change something? But one thing that people really loved about the LX100 was just how it handled in the hand. You know, walking around doing this kind of stuff. I love that I've got the exposure comp right there as a dial. The shutter speed controls are all nice. You've got tactile response with the aperture ring. It actually feels a lot like what was good about the Fuji X100 series, you know? It's a beautiful looking camera, simple and understated. And the only change that I can really see in a cosmetic way is the grip. They've gone from this sort of chunkier rubber grip to this new plastic style grip. I actually like the old grip better, but they both work. You get a good solid purchase on there. And you know, the key thing is I don't have a camera bag today because both these cameras easily fit within my jacket pockets. Now, unfortunately, after four years, the EVF hasn't really changed that much. We've got a 2.7 million dot EVF, and this is still the field sequential type where it flashes red, green, and blue images at your brain, and you kind of see it all as one amalgamation. However, if you are moving the camera on quickly, you'll often see this tearing effect. I mean, this is pretty common on a lot of Panasonic EVFs of the lower cost variety. And some people who find it very uncomfortable to look through these things, they can find it quite disorienting, kind of gives them a headache. So that's unfortunate. I know it saves money, but it's been four years we've got newer technology that's that's too bad now the back screen i've mentioned it doesn't rotate but at least it has improved in resolution it's just over 1.2 million dots on the back here three inch display and the key improvement is it is now a touch screen interface and this is a big deal because one of my main complaints with the original lx100 i like being able to change my iso and my white balance quickly but bringing up my focusing points and then having to use the control pad to move around it was just painfully slow so this is now a big improvement the touch screen is very quick it's very responsive I can easily choose where I want to focus now. As well, when I go into the quick menus or regular menus, I can cycle through there. It gives me extra custom functions. I mean, the touchscreen does open things up. So that is a nice improvement. Oh, I'm gonna bitch about one more thing though. This back dial, it's still the same chintzy plastic dial. It's, it's just sloppy and light feeling, but it does work. Now the LX100 Mark II has the exact same chassis as the original, and so that means a few things. Uh, no weather sealing still, unfortunately. And the lens, it looks like the exact same apparatus and design, and that's unfortunate in this one way. The original LX100 had a lot of issues with dust getting inside the lens, getting onto the sensor, and of course being unremovable not easy to get rid of that sensor dust. So you have a lot of work in Photoshop afterwards. And unfortunately, it looks like we have the exact same issue here. I can't confirm that 100%. I'm certainly not gonna throw talcum powder all over this thing and try to find that out. It just means you kind of have to baby this camera more than you would normally baby a camera. I mean, throwing it in your pocket like I'm doing today is a selling feature. And yet, I guess make sure your pockets are clean. Now, by far, the most unique feature about the Panasonic LX100 was how they took a, relatively speaking, fairly large micro four-thirds sensor and crammed it into a very compact body, and then coupled that with a beautiful 24 to 75, 1.7 to 2.8 zoom lens, and again, keeping it very compact and small. So how do they do that? Well, they had a very simple and yet quite elegant solution. They simply cropped into the sensor a little bit. So you're getting an effective micro four thirds sensor, but with a loss of resolution. But it did let you have a lot of different aspect ratios that you could go through because 
the sensor covered the lens circle as you change those ratios. You can do one to one, you can do four, three, three, two, 16 by nine with a minimal change in resolution. On the original 16 megapixel sensor, you were down to 12 effective megapixels. And that's not the end of the world, but it wasn't certainly ideal. So what we now have on the LX100 Mark II is a brand new sensor that the GX9 uses. This is a 20 megapixel sensor and it gives you roughly 17 megapixels of useful resolution. So we've got that new sensor in there. What else has changed in the last four years? We've got a new Venus processing engine, of course, and that's given us some really good improvements. I mean, first off, we find the low light performance is better on this now. We get nice noise reduction. Uh, they've also changed their color science in that four years. And, you know, frankly, I always like the original Panasonic color science. I found it to be very uh, realistic, you know, nice skin tones. But here on the new sensor with the new engine, we get punchy color if we want, and we get really nice skin tones. Now, on top of that, we get some new color filters. You got the new monochrome modes, which are nice. You get the monochrome L, the monochrome D, higher contrast, different kinds of looks. Overall, this will give a lot of people some creative stuff to play with. But I do like the image quality. It's a nice improvement. So a couple things here. First off, I like the close-up capability. It was always good. But being on my hands and knees on the ground, not the most comfortable thing here. And I have to do that because this screen doesn't rotate or tilt in any way, shape, or form. And that would have been really nice. I mean, for shots like this, but even for street photography, if you're just trying to get grab shots and stuff. Now, of course, with the new processing engine, you now get Panasonic's much lauded 4K photo modes. And they've added all the new ones too. You get focus stacking, you get image sequence, and all the old ones like pre-burst, which I personally really like. If you haven't watched our video yet on Panasonic's 4K and 6K photo modes, that's a good one to watch. It'll teach you everything. The only thing I would keep in mind is this. You are getting a crop factor here. It's just over 1.3 times. So your 24 millimeter lens is now more like a 32 millimeter lens. I like for action where your telephoto range goes even further, but I guess if you're doing macro or landscape where you really want to get a nice wide perspective and field of view, keep in mind you're going to lose a little bit about that. You're always in my shot. You're still in my shot, Jordan. If it's not your shadow, it's your reflection. And if it's not your reflection, it's your giant tall body. I don't even like the photo I got. <laughs> now when it comes to battery life, the Panasonic LX100 Mark II actually compares very favorably against the Canon and Sony one inch cameras in the market. In fact, you're getting 340 shots super rated. That's a really nice improvement. It's actually comparable to APS-C mirrorless cameras on the market. And my only complaint there, it's gone USB charging. I mean, that's good. We should have that. But you're still not getting external charger in the box. And this is, you know, not what I would call an affordable camera. And I know Sony doesn't give it to you either, but that doesn't make the problem better. They should give you an external charger as well. Everybody should give you an external charger. Yes, I'm old fashioned, but I still think it should be in there. Now, speaking of modernizations for 2018, we also get Bluetooth compatibility. That's great. You always have that constant connection with your phone if you want, and it is lower power consumption. That's a good thing because all you can do is charge slowly through the USB port. Like any motorized zoom camera, when I turn this puppy on, I have to wait for that to go out. There's a little bit of a delay before I can start shooting. And on top of that, we're talking about a motorized zoom. It is fairly slow to zoom in and out. I mean, this is nothing new. I guess I would have hoped that they'd improve that, but it's the same lens and the same assembly, so it's the same kind of slower speed, unfortunately. Now, it's a good thing that the battery life is, is actually exceptional for a camera this size because I could just walk around on the street and leave the zoom out, kind of let it fall asleep, quick wake up and keep shooting. That'd be my solution. The only downside there is if I want to stuff this in my pocket, you don't want to do it with that lens extended. Now let's say you want to do sequential shooting, but you don't want to use the 4K photo mode. Well, the LX100 Mark II is pretty much the same as the original. You're getting 5.5 frames per second with continuous autofocus and 11 frames per second without. But the buffer has been improved so you can shoot longer bursts. As a photographer on the street, honestly, 5.5 frames per second with autofocus is plenty fast for me. I don't think that's really a big detriment. And again, a lens range like this isn't gonna suit itself to wildlife and sports. It's always nice to have the creative option to use filters, polarizers, and the such. And the LX100 and Mark II have a 43 mil incorporated filter thread on the lens but I like to use adapters so I can use 52 mil which I have a whole bunch of at home the only downside take off this bezel before you turn off the camera because it won't close all the way you get lens errors not good probably not good for the lens so just keep that in mind all right autofocus time pretty standard Panasonic stuff they only use contrast detect but they use their DFD autofocusing and what I'd say is 
some of the best single autofocus capability. This isn't as fast as some of the other cameras like the Panasonic G9, but it's very quick from single autofocus, putting your point up, pushing the button and getting a shot is lightning fast and single. In continuous autofocus, I don't know if it's because the lens can't keep up or what, you know, just the new system, I'm not sure, but you're still gonna get better continuous autofocus out of other cameras on the market. The continuous autofocus, though, still does that classic Panasonic thing where it's just shaking, shaking, shaking. Most of the time it does a good job, but you just never really know where your focus is. And I don't know, sometimes you find that it is just a little bit behind the point where we want it to be. But overall, pretty confident platform. The image stabilization system is also very good. Uh, you know, I one hand these small kinds of cameras way more than I should, trying to get interesting angles or get low to the ground. And again, no problems, nice and stable. Shutter makes basically no shake whatsoever. And as I've mentioned before with the touch screen, the only complaint I have about the whole autofocusing kind of system here really is, although I love having the touch screen to change my focusing point, it is flush with the body. And so you get that classic, uh, you know, where your palm goes over the screen, your thumb brushes up against it by accident, and you find your focusing point off in a corner somewhere. So be mindful of that. When you're shooting, assume that it's not gonna be in the same place it was before and get used to just touching where you want it to be as a habit and shooting rather than expecting it. Oh, to be in the center where I left it? No, it's in the top right corner. It's Jordan to talk about video, and Panasonic's known for having great video features on all their stills camera. This is really the exception to the rule. I'd say this is their least video-centric camera in the Lumix lineup. First of all, kind of the obvious things, we don't have a mic jack and headphone jack, so we have to use the internal audio while I'm talking right now. Also, no tilting screen, articulating screen, but purely looking at it in terms of the video quality, I do find the 4K on this is a little bit soft and also quite over-sharpened. Uh, there's also a crop when you cut in, which you actually can't see until you start recording, which can really be infuriating. In terms of slow-mo recording, it's capped at 108060 with a low data rate. In a pinch, you can get an okay video clip with this, but this is not a video camera by any stretch of the imagination. However, I did find one really interesting use for this camera as a time-lapse camera, because you've got USB power, you can run it for a long time, it's got a great built-in 4K mode where it'll save the RAW files and JPEGs, but also build a sequence for you. And you've got a filter thread on it, so you can use heavy NDs to get a nice smooth sense of action like we've got here. This is one of the best set it up and forget it time-lapse cameras on the market right now, and I don't know if a lot of people are looking at it that way. I certainly would. The LX100 was a much loved camera. And what I like about this new version is they've kept all of the good stuff the same. It's still very familiar. It's still very easy to fall in love with this camera. I also think that the LX100 is the perfect size. You know, there's smaller cameras out there, but this is great. You get a great grip on it. It handles well. You get nice dial controls, but it's still very easy and portable to take around with you. You still can't help but feel though, like we've waited four years and we haven't gotten that much of an upgrade. Granted, the new sense Sensor, some of the refinements to the autofocusing speed, the touch screen, I do like these changes, but it still does feel very much like the same camera. Hence, they didn't say LX200, they went to a Mark II. Now, the LX100 Mark II really sits in this strange spot between one inch sensor cameras and APS-C cameras. And if you're gonna make me compare those, well, here we go. If I put all the one inch sensor cameras together, what does this give us? Slightly better light gathering capability, absolutely with that bright lens and slightly larger sensor. Resolution now because the upgraded sensor is very comparable. I'm not gonna worry about three megapixels. So really we're looking at a camera with very comparable image quality to a lot of the one inch cameras out there. That does mean you have some very compact choices on the market from other brands that give you similar quality. Now, if we look at APS-C cameras, a lot of those cameras are going to have slower lenses. If you look at something like the Fuji X-T20, however, with its 1855 2.8 to f4 kit lens, after you look at sensor equivalency, that's roughly the same amount of light. But I think the key thing to remember here is this gives you a lot of that same image quality with a more compact body design. Considering the fact that the image quality here is largely the same as the one-inch cameras, 
the Sony RX100 5A, the new version, looks really good compared to this camera. It is smaller, yes, but it does have an OLED viewfinder. It's got a tilty screen, much more sophisticated autofocus, faster continuous shooting, and much better video capability. So on a specs basis, I do think that for a similar price point, that camera's probably a better choice. But the photographer in me, thinking with my heart, I actually enjoy this body design better. I like the tactile feel. I like the controls. I just like the way that it operates, even if it does have inferior specs in a lot of ways. And so in that regard, you gotta put this camera in your hands and try it out. And if the screen doesn't bother you, if the RGB tearing viewfinder doesn't bother you, if you don't need the advanced video features, I think you're gonna find this to have beautiful image quality, a brilliant lens, and overall a very enjoyable photographic experience. I hope you guys enjoyed this review on this camera. Don't forget, leave us comments below. Check out our Instagram feeds and our Twitter feeds. Let us know what you think. And until next time, don't forget, I'll always be thinking with my heart as well as my head. See you guys next time.